Take your Bibles with me, please. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and put a marker there. 2 Timothy 2. We'll be there in just a minute. And then go to Ephesians chapter 4, would you? Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, two weeks ago, I preached uh, from, uh, began in this message on God's multiplication plan. And uh, we're continuing with this portrait, this profile of the multiplying disciple. If you remember, Acts 2.41 talks about they gladly received his word, were baptized the same day rather than about 3,000 souls. So there's this gospel explosion at the beginning when the Holy Ghost came down and, and at Pentecost. And, and uh, what a day. And they were added. Remember, we talked about they're added. And it's exciting to me about that because they had what we have, the gospel and the Holy Spirit. And uh, the same uh, power that God wants to work today through his word and through the spirit of God. And so adding was happening. And I'll spare you the Noah's Ark joke about the adders tonight. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you, you were here last time, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but notice the significant change in chapter 6. And so uh, in Acts chapter 6, there's this multiplication plan. You don't have to turn there. But let me just read Acts 6 and verse 1. I put you already at two other places. Acts 6 and verse 1, he says... Uh, there that multiplication begins. It was just adding, adding. Now, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglecting the daily ministration. So we see this M&M &M ordered, multiplied, ministry, murmuring. And when members multiply in a church and additional, additional ministries uh, are needed in a church, uh, both to minister and provide for them like these widows, but also to engage them in the work of the Lord. God wants everybody involved in his work. He didn't save you to sit in a church. This is not the work. This is the charge station. This is plugging in the phone so you can use it tomorrow. This is plugging in your laptop so it'll work tomorrow. This is the charging station so that you can do the work God's called you to. Uh, Ephesians 4, if you'd look there with me. The, the, and of course, murmuring followed multiplication and, until the ministries and things that were needed uh, got going. And, and anytime there's people, it's a simple truth. You know that if you uh, leave your house ever, uh, right? <laughs> if you work a job, anywhere there's people, there's going to be problems of some kind. And, and uh, there are things to be dealt with. And that's uh, why we must do what Ephesians 4 teaches here. I want you to look there in Ephesians 4, and then we'll get to 2 Timothy. But Ephesians 4, uh, beginning in verse uh, number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so this is f the beginning of the church. This is God's gift to the church. 4, verse 12. So he gave this, no period at the end of verse 11. It's a semicolon. 4. The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, I'm going to stop there. It's still, still the same sentence, still not, not a period. But God's there teaching us that what God gave to the church was not to do all the work of ministry and to do all the perfecting of the saints, but that they would bring the saints to maturing so that then they could do what these were doing, these gifts were doing in the church. And so this was for that. God said, here are these gifts to the church. He gave some. Who, who did that? God did. Apostles, prophets. And we know apostles, that is no longer. Prophets, there's no more foretelling. There still is the foretelling. Most of the prophets' work in the Bible was not foretelling future revelation, but it was just the foretelling what God had already said, thus saith the Lord. And then, of course, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, those are ongoing. And he did that for the perfecting of the saints. Well, the perfecting means to bring to maturity, bring to full growth, bring to the place of adulthood. Now he's going to hit that again in verse 14 or 15. We'll read it in just a minute. So he wants to bring you to maturity. Why? So you can be mature. So you can sit back and say, oh, now I can really keep up with what's being preached here and make sure it's right. No, so you can use what you've been soaking in the sponge for someone else, that you could be a channel, not a sponge, to get fat and, fat and, and swelled up with, right? No, I want to be, I want to use this for God. And so for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And so the work of the ministry is not to some select few. Uh, that is what's wrong with the Catholic church and all that have followed that uh, doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, Jesus said in Revelation. 
and it is the idea of the clergy and the laity, professional Christians, and you laity, you just listen to what we tell you. Don't worry about the Bible. Don't read that. I'll tell you what you need to know. That was the idea that was starting way back in the Bible day, which continued and brought in the dark ages and all that through the Catholicism and all those things. They didn't want them to have the Bible in their own language that they actually common language could read. I don't need to give you a history lesson, but, but that's what I'm talking about. God's word would have cleared up all that because there is no professional Christians. We're all to be servants of the Lord. So these gifts were to bring baby Christians, these 3,000 got saved, to maturity. Why? So they can now engage in the ministry. Why? For the edifying of the body of Christ. For the building up of the body of Christ. So it'd be built up and strengthened. No end of the sentence yet. Look at verse 14, uh, 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. You, you go in the nursery, you're not going to get a unified team in the nursery. It's just not going to happen. Why? Because there's a bunch of babies in there. You know why churches have so much fighting and fussing and feuding? Because there's a bunch of babies in there. See, if you bring them to maturity, then they have the ability to have the unity of the faith in Christ. That's what he's talking about. Till, till... So you bring them to maturity and get engaged in the work of the ministry. You know, when you're sweating and working hard, it's hard to fight. Uh, Ryan was talking Sunday night about when you worked hard, you know, on the playgrounds or the thing, you worked a hard day. You don't, you don't have the energy to go and fight with your wife. Like just, I mean, something just fall out, right? Uh, you, if you're working in the ministry, guess what? You don't have the energy to fight and feud with one another in the church. We're, we're on the same team. Uh, military guys may argue and fuss, the Navy versus the Army and the Army and the, against the Marines and so on and so forth. But when they're in the battlefield, hey, they're glad to see someone flying the same flag. I don't care what you're in. Hey, we're all on the same team. See what I mean? When the bullets start flying, we're working together. And that's what God intended, that we don't have time to fight. We have time dog against dog because we're all going after the prize, after the Lord. We're in the hunt for God's work. We're fishing for men. Uh, keep reading here. He says, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. What unifies us? The Lord. We're having this mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. Unto a perfect man. Unto the, here it is, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Still not a period. We'll keep going just a minute. But this is the measure of your Christian life. This is the measure of any church. Not its size, but its sort. The measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, meaning it's Christ likeness. See, this is where church is this mega church idea. There's nothing wrong with a large church. If you go with us to couples retreat that Wednesday night, we'll be at the Temple Baptist Church. They'll have more in the choir on Wednesday night than we have in our church. They have a large church and they preach just like we do and sing just like we do. There's nothing wrong with a large church. But if you have a mega church idea like a church of the Highlands or other type of progressive church, the problem is you may have size, but you haven't measured up to what the Lord's looking at. It's like someone trying to, you know, sh shoot a field goal in a hockey game. <laughs> Yeah, you've been around some of those ladies and they want to enter into the conversation. Sorry, but they don't know what the game is and what the words and t are. Okay. Hey, they don't know what the game is. The game isn't how many we can pack in and have an empire of a church. That's not the game. That's not the goal. The goal is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the goal of the church is not uh, just to have a big crowd. It's to be Christ-like. Now, Christ-like is fishing for men and reaching people. I get all that, but we don't compromise the truth to reach people because what are you reaching them to? We could talk about that all night. Okay, so this is what he says. Here's the measure that we henceforth be no more children. Time to grow up. That's what he's saying. That we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Still no period. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom? 
The whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. You ought to mark the word every. According to the effectual working and the measure of every part. You ought to mark the word every. Making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love, period. Boy, the Holy Spirit can write a sentence, can he? I hate to have to diagram that sentence. But God is helping us understand if God's work is going to be done God's way, then everybody's in the game. Everybody's a participant. Everybody is in the struggle and in the fight and engaged in the work. And those that want to just go to church and think they've done for the week, then they have missed everything God's word is talking about. Praise God for church and praise God for the recharge and praise God for the word of God. But that is not the goal. That is, like I said, the recharge station so we can go work at the goal, which is the work of God in this world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel uh, to every creature. And so God's plan is outlined here in Ephesians. And it's simple truth here uh, that if we'll uh, do what the word of God says, look, we must never underestimate the value of one soul. Addition, praise God for the addition. But our Lord does not have such a small goal for you or for me or for that one soul. God wants to take that one soul and not make it just an addition, but now a multiplication factor in the work of God is much more planned for you and for me and for every believer than just addition. He wants to multiply. So we need to immediately stop asking, how many decisions, how many additions did you have? And begin asking, how many disciples are you building? That's the question. This is where the emphasis of Scripture is being a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. We're not simply looking for a decision, a prayer prayed, but a follower, a disciple of the Lord. So last time we talked about, number one, the profile, the profile of a multiplying disciple. This is what I'm to be. This is what I'm to look like. So tell me, explain to me of this disciple. What does he look like? What, what's, what's he, who, who is he? We're going to look at in a future message what he's to do, but this is what he's to be. This is what he looks like. All right. What does a disciple look like? Well, now go to 2 Timothy, would you? 2 Timothy. And we find seven pictures in 2 Timothy chapter 2 of a disciple. This is the classic passage. You know 2 Timothy 2.2, two, right? The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. So there's that famous passage. Well, in this passage, he gives seven pictures, and every picture supplies a part of the full picture or profile or portrait of a New Testament disciple. Last time, we just got to the first one, a son. A son, verse 1 and 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the graces in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. We talked about this last time. On a missionary journey, he meets a man named Timothy. He meets grandma and, and, and mother, Eunice and Lois, and, and, and he leads him to Christ, it seems, or maybe he'd been saved, but he begins to disciple him. He sees an aptitude for the Lord, sees a desire for God. And the next journey, he meets him. He says, come on, come with me. Me? How am I going to help what you're doing? You just pray for me. You watch me. You, you, and then at night, we'll talk and I'll disciple you. I'll invest in you. He says in verse 2, And the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same. Commit thou to faithful men and should be able to teach others also. I'm going to multiply. I don't want everyone to have to learn from Paul. I'm going to try to teach some from Paul, but you're going to be over here soon teaching some from Timothy. That's how it's going to multiply. That was the Lord's way. This is our way. And so he's saying, you heard something. I, I mentioned last time about my dad. And I remember going so with him over and over and over. And I heard something and I saw something. And God was doing something in my heart. And there was a multiplication process happening. He wasn't necessarily talking to me. But I remember hearing much. The things, the things that was heard of me among many witnesses. No doubt that was the same thing that was happening when Paul and Timothy. What does a good son do? Well, a good son learns from his parents. A good son loves his parents, obeys his parents, extends the family traits. And so does a spiritual son. And we ended with this last time. You are a son or a daughter spiritually to someone. In the faith, you're a son in the faith, daughter in the faith to someone. To someone. Here's the question. Do you have any sons in the faith or daughters in the faith yourself? Do you have someone that you're pouring your life into? 
And there's a question with heads bowed and eyes closed last time that we ended with. If every Christian in the church was like you, if every member of GLBC was like you, what would the next generation of our church look like? Or would there be a next generation? And so this is God's plan for multiplication. So a son, then the next portrait, a soldier. Look at verse three. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth, still talking about a soldier, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. Now turn over to Matthew chapter six, if you would, for just a minute. What does a good soldier do? Well, a good soldier, he abandons all his plans, all his purposes to fulfill the duty assigned. And what does a good soldier have? A good soldier has a mission. He's got a mission. The mission is the important thing. He has a mission. Well, guess what? God has called us to a mission. We call it the Great Commission. Go ye, right? A soldier doesn't think, what am I, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I to wear? No, don't worry. They'll tell you all that. A soldier doesn't plant crops. Why? Food is provided for him. He has one thing to do, and that is to get in the fight and engage in the mission that God has given him. Or in this case, a, the captain, whatever, has given him. That's what a soldier does. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Christ's discipleship course, if you will, for his uh, disciples there. In Matthew chapter 6, remember at the end there, as he's uh, uh, coming to the end of Matthew 6, he says there in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat. Nor what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? I love that thought. He's saying, do you think I just made your body for food? You think I just made your body for clothes? No, there's more to life than food. I know that's hard to believe for us guys, but there's more to life than food. And ladies, there's more to life than clothes, all right? There's something bigger, something more. And that's what he's saying here. Keep reading. Hold the fowls of the air. They sow not, neither they to reap, or get into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit into his stature? And why take ye thought for the raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon, great King Solomon, all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What is he saying? He's saying the lost, the heathen, even the Gentiles, he's saying, they, they, they are worried about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear. He said, come on, I don't think about that. But that's not, not really true, is it? If this was Sunday morning, you all be thinking, what, where are we going to have? What are we going to eat? Where are we going to go to eat after? You know, we're, we're always thinking about it. Maybe you're thinking right now, yeah, that's right. I got a piece of pizza left at the house. I'm going to have that after. You know, right? We're, we're always thinking about what we're going to eat. But he's saying, hey, that's what this world, what, what's the new outfit? What, what Christmas dress? What Easter dress? What, you know, the new thing. Always those type things. This is the people of the world. But that's the low level purposes of life. That's the low level stuff. Hey, you're a soldier. The Lord has called you to some mission that is higher than that. That's what he's saying. No, you don't. That's what they're worried about. Verse 34, he concludes, take therefore no thought for the morrow of the morrow. Should take for the, thought for the things of itself, sufficient in the day is evil thereof. What should I do then? Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, the mission and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Look, a soldier doesn't worry about what he's going to wear, what he's going to eat. The captain takes care of all that. He's ready to fight. He has one duty, and that's his mission. This is the picture of the disciple. This is the picture of the New Testament Christian that I'm to be and that you're to be. What a portrait. Portrait. We have a higher calling. Then the next picture is an athlete. Verse 5, 2 uh, Timothy, back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. So here's an athlete. Well, what does a good athlete do? Well, a good athlete applies himself totally to that sport. Can you imagine being an Olympic athlete? We think, you know, uh, football is so long between, you know, a whole week before another game. Is a bye week or two weeks? Can you imagine four years to the next game, right? I know they have different games in between, world games, other things they compete in. But, but these athletes train for one thing for years, for these moments, right? And what do they do? Well, an athlete's disciplined. 
They have to say no to many things. He says no to lots of things for the bigger yes, right? I can't eat pizzas and all these different things all the time. I have to eat certain things for my body to be able to perform at, at this level. And, and I, I have to exercise so much. I've got to get up so early to do all my exercise and running or whatever the thing is. He steadily masters the required skills and strives for mental discipline as well as physical to excel. That's what an athlete does. Well, a Christian disciple will do no less in following Christ. That's what he's saying, verse five. Then the next picture is a husbandman. Verse six, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. A husbandman, what's that? Well, a farmer, right? A farmer. What does a farmer do? What does a good farmer do? He labors. <laughs> he labors. <laughs> he labors, right? And you grow up on a farm, your family farm. Okay, a uh, few. Farmers, that's hard work. I mean, especially before, I mean, now the, some of these tractors, no one's even driving them anymore. Do you know that? They have GPS, computers. It's unbelievable. That's true. It used to be, though, the old mule and different things. I mean, hard, hard labor and work and still lots of hard work. But what does he do? Well, he breaks up the soil. He, he sows the seed. He, he cultivates the, he reaps the crop. He, he puts seed away for the next year. He, he, he's sowing, he's reaping, he's multiplying. Then a workman. Look at verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. As Christian disciples, we're here to labor, not to loaf. To labor, a workman. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, who did he write that to? Must have been a pastor somewhere or, or, a, or a missionary somewhere or uh, the apostle. No, the apostle, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was writing that to the church at Corinth. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, this meeting, this, this church service, like I said earlier, this is the charge up station. This is the plug in to go back out from these four walls and serve the Lord out there. I said the work is out there. That's where God has us to work. And, and if you're thinking, well, I just made it to church. Pastor, so I'm going to be happy I got in here. Well, I'm glad you're here. Get charged up. But this is not the end. This isn't the work. The work is out there. And so if you're on the sidelines, friend, God didn't save you to be on the sidelines. God wants you to get in the work. He wants you to labor in the work. Here's the question. How have you been spent for Christ this past week? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. How have you been spent? How have you labored as a workman for Christ? Verse 15 says, study to show thyself. What's the next three word? Approved unto who? Not your Sunday school teacher. Not to the pastor. Approved unto God. A workman that need not to be ashamed. When can you say you last labored for the Lord? Have you, can I ask you this way? Have you been out of breath for Jesus Christ? Working, laboring, out of breath for the Lord. Maybe you ought to ask the Lord that. Lord, how have I been in laboring for you? Being spent. Not, not for a career, but for Christ. He said, this is the picture of the disciple. Approved unto God. Again, not me. Would you ask the Lord that? How have you been out of breath for Christ? How about laboring and discipling someone? How have you done there? Jesus, remember what he said in Matthew 9, 37, then saith he unto the disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. But what? The laborers. Laborers. The workmen are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send for laborers into his harvest. A workman. Then a vessel. A vessel. These seven portraits here. Notice verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a 
vessel. So here's another picture of this disciple. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet or fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. When I go home, if there's a dirty dish in the sink, that is not meat. It's not fit. It's not prepared for me to eat off that. But if there's a clean dish in the dishwasher, that is meat. That is prepared. That is fit for use. That's what he's saying here, that we are to be a vessel that's prepared for the master's use. What is a vessel? I mean, this is a vessel. A vessel is just a hollow object. It's a, so what's the purpose of a vessel? To contain something. Or should I say it this way? To contain someone. Uh, turn one, one place, would you? 2 Corinthians. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what the Bible says about the vessel were to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll give you a minute. Turn over there, would you? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You need to mark it. Beginning verse 2. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2. We're on the sixth picture. Just one more in this portrait. And we'll be through. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In verse 2, the Bible says there, but have, have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty and uh, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's where I meant to start, verse 3. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine to them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. What treasure? The Lord Jesus Christ. The light that shined out of darkness into our life, this treasure we have in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Here in 2 Timothy, he says, you're to be a vessel, a vessel filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. He's put himself in you, himself in me, and he didn't put himself in you or in me to sit and do nothing. He put himself in us to do something for him. It's like having a car in the garage and you say, are you going to drive it? No, but I'm going to put gasoline in it. Well, why do you need gasoline in it if you're not going to drive it? See, why do you need the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Why do you need the Lord inside of you if you're not going to do something for him? Why do you need the unction if you're not going to function, right? A vessel is containing something and someone, the Lord Jesus, as Christians were intended to contain and convey the very life of Christ. Uh, Jesus himself would say before he ascended, he said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. John 20, 21. He said, that's a simile, that's a comparison in your English. As, as the Father, with the same authority, with the same force, with the same importance, I send you now to carry out the life of Christ through you. I put myself in you. The Father's business is placed in our hands. A Christian disciple never has to wonder whether his master wants to fill him or not. Ephesians 5.18 commands us, be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That vessel is supposed to be full of the Lord, letting him overflow in our life. And then the last picture is a servant. The last in this picture, to make the full picture of the profile of the disciple, look at verse 24, a servant and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil or taken captive by him at his will. And the servant of the Lord. Servant literally means bond slave. Look, a servant a slave, which we are willingly, we're a love slave. Uh, we, didn't, we're not, we don't want to a servant because we have to be. We're one of the servants that we had a good master. We loved our master. He said, I want to stay with my master. And so they put the ear to the door in the, in, in the Bible days and bore all through it. Would say to everybody, this 
slave has a good, good master and he wanted to stay with his master. He didn't want to go free. That's what we have. We have a good master and I don't ever want to be free from this. He's the one that set me free from the chains of the devil, and the chains of sin. I want to stay with him. And so the servant, the slave, uh, he has no will of his own. He has no schedule of his own. You know, pastor, you don't understand the schedule I have. Listen, don't talk to me. You got to take that up with the Lord. He's your master. He's the one that said all this. You'll answer to the Lord. No schedule, no rights of his own. The servant has no property of his own. He's a steward. He's completely dependent on his master. He's completely at his master's disposal. However, he's not lacking resources, praise the Lord. Uh, the master's checkbook also provides where he guides and leads. Just like that soldier, he doesn't pay for the battle. The, the nation, the captain, they take care of all that, all the supplies. And so it is with the Christian disciple. So number one, we see the profile of a multiplying disciple. This is what I'm to be, what I'm to look like. This is what a disciple looks like. Seven portraits of it there in chapter two, 2 Timothy. And next time we preach on this, and we'll finish this message then, we'll see how I'm to disciple what I'm to do. So here we see, this is what a disciple is. This is what I'm to be as a disciple. This is what I'm to be. Remember, being is more important than doing. What you are is more important than what you do. If you will be the right person, you will do the right things. But you can do the right things without being the right person, but you won't do that long. Next time, what I'm to do. Let me conclude with this. I've been doing some reading on the Black Plague or plagues, you might call it, went from the 14th to the 17th century. They said it was still around even to the 19th century. And in some ways, it's still around even in some places, they say in small amounts from time to time. The bubonic plague, it was, plague, it was called the Black Death, it was called. They estimate from between the 14th century to the 17th century that 75 to 200 million people died from the Black Death. Unbelievable. There were some cities, and I saw pictures of, of what, or, or drawings of what, the, the mass graves. There were some cities that, can you imagine, the city, 40% of the city died. Some places, 50%, as much as 60%. Can you imagine that? The greater Birmingham area here, a million people. Can you imagine if 600,000 or half a million people died? Just unbelievable. The amount of death. Well, as you start looking at that, they, there's two, two parts to it. They say that it was not the rats that, that caused the, the, um, uh, the plague to, to transmit, but the fleas on the rats. Well, I don't know. They also, also as you read about, they said there was a mnemonic effect. There was a, a, even a coughing and breathing of, of it as well. But it's very interesting. It went all over the world. And those rats or the fleas on the rats, uh, they didn't make a special trip to deliver the Black Plague. They were just going. They were just going about their regular life, but it transmitted, it infected all over thousands, millions. See, that's what God intended for, for me and for you. That's what, that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, the things thou hast heard of me, the infecting you've heard of me with the gospel, if you will, this contagion, this, this the Lord that has captured us, that has consumed us, the love of Christ constraineth me. His love has changed me. We have to infect others with that. The things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, the same commit thou, deposit into, infect. The same to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. Charles Spurgeon, let me read what he wrote on joy, this joy contagion. There's a marvelous medicinal power in joy. Most medicines are distasteful, but this, which is the best of all medicines, is sweet to the taste. Comforting to the heart. This blessed joy is very contagious. One sorrowful spirit brings a kind of plague into the house. One person who's wretched seems to stop all the birds from singing wherever he goes. But the grace of joy is contagious. Holy joy will oil the wheels of your life's machinery. Holy joy will strengthen you for the, your daily labor. Holy joy will beautify you and give you an influence over the lives of others. This joyous contagion. See, Paul had thoroughly infected Timothy. And Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge if one died for all and we're all dead. Listen, the Lord Jesus died on the cross, your death, my death, 
paid your sin debt. If you're not saved here tonight, I want you to know Jesus already paid the penalty. He already paid the bill. All you have to do is receive. Receive. Just receive the gift. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He paid it. Paid in full. Paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, right? 1 Corinthians 16, 15 says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus. That is the first fruits of Achaia. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Boy, they, had, they got infected with it good. They had caught it. Jesus' example. Jesus had consumed them. And the Bible says, our God is a consuming fire. He consumed them. He had constrained them. This is the profile of a disciple. This is God's multiplication plan. Let's bow our heads in prayer. May we?